Good morning and welcome. My name is Andrew Ayers, and I'm a research fellow with the Public Policy Institute of California's Water Policy Center. Thank you for turning into our program today, featuring a panel discussion about the impact of recent rains on California's water. I'd like to thank the SD Bechtel Jr. Foundation for their support of today's event. For today's program, my colleague and senior fellow, Jeff Mount, will give a brief presentation about the importance of better managing wet years in California. In doing so, we can reduce the risk of floods and better prepare for future droughts. This will be followed by an expert panel conversation moderated by Katie Peterson, a research fellow and the associate director of the PPIC Water Policy Center. There are a couple of housekeeping items before we start today's program. First, if you're interested in learning more about the information presented and discussed today, several new fact sheets, as well as the slides from today's presentation are available on our website at ppic.org. Second, PPIC is a public charity and does not take or support positions on any ballot measure or legislation, nor does it support, endorse, or oppose any political parties or candidates for public office. And third, at the end of today's program, we have set aside time to answer audience questions. If you have a question for our panelists, please send an email to the address on the screen, ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. And don't forget to include your name and organization along with your question. And now I'd like to welcome my colleague, Jeff Mount, to give his brief presentation as part of today's program. Good morning, everyone, and, and thank you, Andrew. Um, and of course, I'm broadcasting from my home where someone is mowing the lawn. So uh, as you know, this is the perils of Zoom uh, in our modern time. I want to talk today, uh, kind of set up the panel discussion by talking about the obvious. Uh, we're having an extreme year. Uh, and uh, next slide, please. And it is in a, so there we are. And it is embedded within a series of extreme years. I, I, literally, I want everyone to remind themselves where we were a year ago and the conversations we were having a year ago. And we talk a little bit about how increasing drought intensity makes wet year management much more important, how we routinely fail to store water during wet periods, periods and to remind that flood management is equally important to water supply management. Next slide. So let me go to the sort of, as they say, the, the, to throttle the obvious here, uh, what a difference a year makes, or in this case, two years, as I'm showing here. Uh, our last year at this time, we were pretty freaked out about storage. And, 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 and it was two aspects of storage, which I think is extremely important. First is the storage within a reservoir, which, is, which was very low last year, uh, and then the storage that's in snowpack. We have to remember 30% of our supply comes from snowpack, and that really dictates, the April 1st store, snowpack dictates what kind of year we're going to have on top of reservoir storage. And 2021 was was almost the worst ever, and now 2023 is almost the best ever, depending on your point of view. Next slide. Here's the thing, and we've been saying this for years at, 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 at PPIC and our colleagues and universities and agencies around the world have been saying, we are looking at increasing precipitation volatility, that this huge transition from what we saw in the 2020 to 2022 drought to suddenly here in 2023 with record snowpacks in the Southern Sierra, for example, uh, this is our future. Uh, and it's it, there is every indication this is what it looks like. There's no such thing as no Goldilocks moments in, in water in California. This increasing volatility is something we're gonna have to grapple with. Next slide, please. But embedded within this is something that uh, you know, folks like Mike Dettinger and others have been really talking about a lot uh, over the last 10 years or so, is we're seeing a change in atmospheric conditions. It isn't just that it's these droughts are coming, what seem to be more often, but they're more intense. And the reason they're intense is there's just this growing atmospheric thirst, thirst that kicked in after the year 2000 uh, called evaporative demand. So it's just literally pulling more water out of the landscape. So we're seeing we're seeing it's, our dries are dryers, our wets are probably getting wetter, and of course we're seeing very rapid shifts in conditions. Next slide, please. And I, I this is this this is a point we made in our in our policy priorities piece last fall. 
uh, that we have got to find a way to cope with more intense drought, not focusing solely on demand management, but we need to do a better job of storing water in wet years. And I put up here this example from the Delta that we showed last fall, and then the work that Greg Artrell did a year ago on this, where we looked at accounting. You know, and in wet, in wet year 2017, the overwhelming majority of outflow from the Delta was just simply uncapturable outflow. We left a lot of water on the table that could have been used, basically, could have been pumped from the Delta, it, it, even within existing regulations. And then the flip side in 2021, not one drop of water that basically fell on the watershed made it out of the Delta. We had to rely entirely on dams. So we got to do a much better job of balancing these two kinds of years because they're going to be more frequent. Next slide. And then finally, I, I, with the nickname Dr. Doom, I can't resist reminding all of you that what we tend to do is we tend to balkanize uh, water management into the flood people. And we're going to hear from a flood person today, but the flood people and the water supply people. Uh, and this is this we do this at our peril because the economic risks associated with flooding are somewhere in the same ballpark, if not greater uh, than the economic risks associated with drought. And people tend to die during during flooding. And if we had a big flood, we would be looking at a and more than a trillion dollars in damages uh, statewide. So flood risk, like drought risk, needs a lot of attention. And of course, as we've pointed out in previous publications, there's a big social justice issue here as well. Next slide. So we're going to throw this at our panel today uh, and, and let them sort of deal with this, this, this increasingly binary climate that we have and the instruments that we use to manage it. So let me go to the next slide. And I want to remind you uh, that we, if you have questions for the panelists or any of us who've talked here, please send them to the PPIC events quest questions at gmail.com address and be sure to include your name and your affiliation. And with that, let me introduce my colleague, Katie Peterson, uh, who is going to manage the panel today. Uh, and uh, Katie is uh, our associate director of the Watershed Center and, and I mean, Water Policy Center and doing all kinds of wonderful things, particularly in the San Joaquin Valley. And it's perfect to do this. So, Katie, I leave it to you. Thank you very, very much, Jeff, and good morning to everyone. Thank you all for being here. It's my pleasure to be moderating this discussion with this excellent panel this morning. So I'm going to start by introducing each of our panelists one by one. I'm just going to, in the interest of time, keep their introductions brief. But if you'd like to know a little bit more about each of them, their full bios are posted on the event page on our website at ppic.org. So feel free to check that out. First up is Keith Lilly. Keith is the Deputy Director of LA County Public Works in the Water Resources Core Service Area. So Keith wears a bit of a dual hat. Uh, he's responsible for managing the county's flood control, control district, as well as its clean water and stormwater quality compliance efforts. Welcome, Keith. It's great to have yeah, you. Thank you. Great to be here. Next, Tim Ramirez. Tim is a member of the Central Valley Flood Protection Board, serving his third term. So this is the flood person that Jeff mentioned. Uh, Tim was first appointed to the board by Governor Brown in 2012, um, and he was since appointed again by Governor Newsom in 2020. We've had Tim on our stage a couple of times before. It's always nice to have him back. Welcome, Tim. Thank you, Katie. And last but not least, Sarah Wolf. Sarah is a farmer and a water management consultant. She works directly with farmers and water districts in the Central Valley to help them adapt to water regulations. So Sarah spent a lot of time on the ground in the central San Joaquin Valley, particularly helping folks navigate everything from the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, SIGMA, uh, to groundwater recharge efforts. So it's wonderful to have Sarah on our virtual stage today. Welcome. Thank you for having me. All right, so let's jump right into the discussion. Uh, as, as Jeff so pi picturesquely laid out for us, this rainy season has brought some bright spots balanced by Quite a lot of challenges. So most of our reservoirs are looking much better than they have in years. We've broken records for snowpack in some areas. And on the other hand, we've seen catastrophe, right? We've seen loss of life, loss of property. And now we're looking ahead to this summer with a bit of apprehension, I think, on a couple of counts. One is, are we going to be able to handle the snow melt that is inevitably coming our way? And two, are we going to get done what we need to get done to make the most of this wet year and really build our resilience for the next dry year on the way. Um, so I'm, I wanna start this conversation just by kind of taking stock. 
what did we do well this rainy season and what needs to improve? And I wanna start with Keith. So from your perspective as someone who works both in flood management and stormwater, which is also a water quality issue for LA County, how did the county fare overall? What's your assessment of what went well and what didn't? Um, and people would probably also be curious to hear a little bit about Measure W if you wanna explain a bit about that. Sure, so um, you know, I, I, it has been a busy year. It's been, it's been exciting for those of us who have spent our careers in uh, water and flood control infrastructure and you know hey we finally got some some good rain and our, our teams got to go out and do flood fighting uh, our system performed very well um, you know we we didn't get uh, quite the intensities that, that some other areas got in the state um, you know we had 12 atmospheric rivers though so we got a, a lot of rain way more than we've seen uh, we estimate maybe out of a once in 25 year event so uh, not the hundred year storm you hear about, uh, but we had we had multiple versions of that or times. Um, uh, we did not have the the flooding and uh, loss of life that that we saw in some other areas. Uh, but what we did see on the news was that, hey, there's water going out the LA River to the ocean. Why why aren't you capturing that? What what do you know? Why not? Uh, and, and in reality, we did do do pretty well. We captured uh, uh, on average, we normally capture about two hundred thousand acre feet of, of water. Um, this year, we've captured about uh, 388,000 acre feet. So that's enough water for 3.1 million residents uh, for a year in Los Angeles County. So that's, that's uh, uh, you know, good, good news. You know, we've re recharged our groundwater aquifers. Um, you know, we, we did that while operating our system. It's a dual system, uh, you know, built, built, you know, well, the flood control district formed in 1915, and they had the dual mission to both control and conserve the water. So they had the foresight when they built the system of dams and, and spreading grounds or spreading grounds for these basins where we can direct the water to recharge uh, the groundwater. Um, they, they had the, the, the foresight to build them that way, uh, and, and we were able to, to take advantage of that this storm season. A kind of new uh, element that we have is the Safe Clean Water Program that, that you talk about or that you mentioned, uh, which was uh, a voter approved partial tax uh, that pays for capturing and cleaning stormwater runoff. So it 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 is not a flood control um, uh, program, but it captures stormwater to clean it, basically to comply with water quality uh, requirements for keeping our beaches and rivers, oceans, uh, ponds, lakes, streams clean. Uh, but what we did is is made a multi benefit approach. So when we capture that water to clean it, we also conserve and, and reuse that water either on site or, or infiltrate into our groundwater basin. And we combine that with multi-benefit uh, projects. So it may be a, a, a park, it helps reduce heat island effect, uh, recreational facilities, increased shade, uh, habitat, et cetera. So it, it's uh, kind of got all these things and it's, it's more a, a neighborhood and community scale. And these really did a good job of, of capturing water every time it rained and cleaning it. So that first flush, kind of those nasties, uh, it picked those up. So we felt the, the and I know I'm going a little long here, but the, the, the biggest benefit I thought from that program was it, it really got a lot of attention. People were saying, hey, water's going out to the ocean. You have this new program, why aren't you doing more? And, and I think that's opened up a conversation to, to really look at, at what we can do more in the region. Mm -hmm, great. Yeah. So kind of a public perception thing, prompting some evaluation there. Um, I'm going to come back to you a little bit on that, but I want to kick it over to Sarah for the Central Valley perspective a little bit. From what you've seen working with growers, working with water man managers in the Valley, did we have any more success socking away some water this year relative to past wet years? And I'll note that there are kind of two aspects to this question, right? The first is how did we do early in the season when we were all taken a little bit by surprise um, by the intensity of these storms? And, and the other aspect is how, how are we doing now that we kind of know what's coming our way, right? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I do think, um, you know, looking at the visuals that Jeff Mount put up there a moment ago, that's the exact kind of what we came off of of 2017. We saw all this water going out um, through our rivers and streams into the ocean and knowing their need for capturing it, we really began the process then after 2017 to try to figure out alternatives for 
capturing that water in an efficient way. So we did a lot of um, preparing for the next big storm, if you will, and most of that under the regulatory umbrella going after appropriate water right permits that are issued by the State Water Resources Control Board. And those appropriative water rights would allow for us to divert water in times of flood off of various streams and um, flood, flood bypasses and put them to a beneficial use by recharging them, by putting them into the ground and percolating in, into the aquifer. Um, a lot of those applications have gone in and are being reviewed by the State Water Resources Control Board, but... I think there's a lot, there were a lot of policy hurdles in place that didn't allow for those permits to be um, executed in the early storms that we started to see this year. So although we had gone through the process regulatory wise, um, we didn't have the ability still to go out and do that, those recharge activities. And so I think we had some acknowledgement, some willingness on the part of the farmers and the landowners and um, what then happened was the governor issued an executive order in early March that opened up the um, regulatory constraints for landowners to go out and actually do those recharge activities. And I think that's what we are seeing now. And that's what we're going to see going into the summer as these heat waves come and we see more and more um, flows being coming down the streams that we're able to extend this recharge activity and, and pick up some of these flood flows that are occurring. And I think what we're, we're continuing to learn from it, and I think we'll have to adapt throughout the summer. As an example, the governor's executive order just goes through um, June 1st as the period of time that we can divert. In all likelihood, we will need that to be longer since we will be seeing so much water coming down through the summer months. So okay. I think we're, we're learning as we go here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, I'm, I'm sure we'll circle back around to that in a moment when we talk about um, some of the policy level issues that we're dealing with here. Um, but uh, first, let's go to Tim, still taking stock a little bit here. We know we're already dealing with significant flooding in the Central Valley, particularly the San Joaquin River Basin. And of course, there's more water coming your way this summer. So give us an overview. What, what impacts are you seeing right now? And what are you particularly worried about as we head into this summer? Great. Thanks, Katie. You know, you mentioned that I've been on um, the stage before. And when I've been here, one of the things we've talked about is the risk the San Joaquin Valley really has for these kinds of years. And we've talked about it hypothetically. And obviously, it's not hypothetical this year. Um, we've really, in the past, talked about how the San Joaquin Valley, the rivers are not plumbed for rainfall events. And we had a lot of rain uh, in January, February, and March. And we did see a lot of flooding and we did see property damage. And that obviously creates a lot of problems. It's a little disappointing to think about that a lot of the things that happened this year happened in 1997. Um, I was disheartened to get the notice that they were uh, evacuating people from the Kwame River again from the same place that they had in 1997. I think we need, to, there's a lot of work to do. I think seeing things that we've seen before, and I have to modify my earlier statement about the San Joaquin not being plumbed for rainfall. It's also not plumbed for this gigantic snowpack. So we don't know what's gonna happen necessarily, and we don't know when, but we know that it's very likely we're gonna have problems in the spring, not just the next few weeks, but the next few months. And so I think we're standing by um, and doing the best we can to make sure we help people um, and we've done some things in the last 25 years that are, um, it's a bit of a buffer. There are places now that we can let water spill out onto the floodplains, and that is making a difference. But I think the system is being tested uh, to a moderate level of flood. Um, it's not the kind of catastrophic flood that we also have seen forecasted in future hydrology. So this is a good reminder and a good test, um, but it's a little disappointing to have some of the same problems that we've had in the past. I hope that this year is something that will really urge people to continue, not just to move forward, but to accelerate the pace and the scale of the work that's been going on. Right, right. So it sounds like some things are moving in the right direction, but potentially not quickly enough. And there were probably some missed opportunities there to learn from past le lessons and past wet years. 
Um, so on that note, I kind of want to shift into the policy side of things here, talk about policy issues as well as funding, which plays a lot into that. It's, uh, as we know, it's difficult to, um, it, it's always difficult to talk about funding for flood management as these things tend to happen um, sporadically, they happen fast, and then they're gone, um, leaving behind a lot of damage in their wake. But first, Keith, you're in kind of a unique situation. As you were saying, you, you fared fairly well in LA County, you managed to avoid disaster. But that also means that you're, you're not eligible for federal disaster funds to support your flood management programs and your stormwater programs. So is funding going to be a challenge for these programs going forward, despite the success you had in implementing the parcel tax through the Safe Clean Water Act? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I really look at our, our you know, regional infrastructure that, that performed so well. Um, you know, it did by, you know, capturing all the, the mud and debris that came down from the mountains, where in other areas you've seen these mud flows impact communities and, and cause damage and require rescues. Uh, we had just from the Jan in January alone, we had over a million cubic yards come in. And it's it's really a, a result of this climate whiplash, right? We see these really dry years. Uh, vegetation is, is very dry. You get more fires. And then when it comes with a, a high intensity rainfall on that burned watershed, it, it sends that sediment in. So um, you know, we kind of feel like we, we are proactive in, in building facilities to capture this million yards of sediment that would have ended up in communities and would have gotten federal assistance to, to move it and recover. And yet now we, we still need to move it and recover and be ready for next, the next season. Um, so so there, is, there is a need for funding to help uh, get these facilities ready for the next, the next round of storms. With safe, clean water, uh, you know, voter approved parcel tax, um, you know, we found a way to fund uh, this, you know, mandatory uh, regulations for, for water quality. It's, it was kind of an orphan that, that has, you know, an unfunded mandate that's out there. And, you know, the residents of the county were, were you know, willing to support that, but it took a lot. It took, it took many years of working with them and it had to be something that's in there for everyone. And that's why it turned out to be such a great multi-benefit program where it is water quality, it is water conservation for water supply resilience, and it is uh, community benefits, you know, where and a lot of these are prioritized for um, underserved communities as well in the program. So we're adding park space where there isn't, you know, recreational areas where there aren't, things like that. Yeah, that's great. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned just kind of what went into that effort to get that measure passed. I think I, I want to touch on that towards the end of our conversation. Um, first, I want to talk to Sarah a bit more. You, you were talking about the governor's executive order uh, from March of this year that allowed water users to capture some of those floodwaters for groundwater recharge purposes and kind of sidestep those regulatory hurdles you were talking about. Um, but I also wonder what you think about the local policy issues that are important here. So how do these play into water users' ability to implement recharge projects? And I'm thinking about things like crediting farmers for a share of the water that they capture and store on their land. What's your take on the local policy element? You know, I think in many places, um, the local policy element had been discussed extensively on, on how to do it, how to allow for a groundwater credit and, um, and storage of that groundwater credit for use at a later time. Um, I do a lot of work in Madera County and Madera County is one of the areas that has applied for one of these appropriative water rights to divert water off of um, the flood bypass infrastructure off the San Joaquin River. And so there had been some prelim preliminary discussions and proposals as to how we would generate a groundwater credit and how it would be utilized. Um, all of that was very philosophical and not tangible to most landowners. It wasn't really understandable until we could actually do it. So back to this executive order, you know, it, it opened up the door for us to actually say, okay, you can now put water on your ground, percolate it into the soil and meter that, that all has to be metered. And um, once you have that, then the, the groundwater 
regulatory agency, the GSA, is able to tell you, okay, you have X amount of groundwater credit in the land that you can apply for the next year that's upcoming and future years. And hopefully when we, if next year is a very dry year and you're unable to um, get the surface supply that we're able to this year, then you'll be able to tap into that groundwater credit that you have stored, you've banked in your underneath your soil. And so because we're able to actually physically do it this year, I think it's been, it's given a lot more opportunity for people to feel it, touch it, deal with it, and know how to manage it, and also um, adapt it within Madera County itself. Um, likewise, I think out in Westlands Water District, where I also farm, um, you know, they've been discussing recharge as well for a long time, trying to prepare for it, trying to figure out how they would manage it. And really, it felt from the grower level that it wasn't going anywhere, that we didn't have a policy in place. We didn't have a way to to prepare for this. But when these storms started happening and excess availability of water supply was out there, they quickly adapted and quickly provided um, a recharge project or program that they would support and allow for groundwater credits to be um, generated and held by the landowner. And what they did, I think that is very beneficial is they said, we don't know everything about the aquifer at this point in time. So therefore, we're going to allow this to occur. We're going to allow it to be um, agnostic to which aquifer it's going to. It's going into your soil profile. You can pull it up regardless of depth up until the year 2030. And so at 2030, hopefully we have gathered enough data to better understand where it's actually flowing, how rapidly, how much needs to be left behind. I think that kind of adaptive management is really critical in this situation because the activity will still occur of recharging and benefiting the aquifer, but the details of, of what that really means beneath the soil will be learned through this process. So that's, it, I was happy to see Westlands do that. And um, I think we're seeing that in a lot of different sub-basins. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is where the rubber is hitting the road, essentially. Is this the moment to start a conversation about making something uh, similar to this executive order permanent? Is, is that something that needs to happen? And what, what needs to occur to facilitate that and, and make sure it's appropriate for the needs? Yeah, I think I mentioned earlier that you know, we were really struggling with getting these um, temporary permits to be applicable for recharge and in these flood events. And there were a lot of, a lot of issues that were standing in our way, um, some of which environmental concerns. So providing things like fish, fish screens um, on floodplains can be very challenging because you only have those areas wet one out of every four years. And so the vandalism, the maintenance, all of those things can be challenging. Um, these are also temporary facilities. You come in when there's a flood event, you're pulling water off, diverting it, and um, and not able to really get the necessary equipment in place, either physically obtain it for rental or get the fish screen facility in place because the channel's wide and full and you're just trying to take a small amount off the top to relieve pressure. And so um, some of those waivers that are now in the executive order are critical because we are an emergency situation. We're dealing with a flood situation. So we can't do all the things we normally would in an early preparation. I think those are the policy items that we really need to look at putting in place for future years. That currently does not exist within our existing water rights system. And so dealing with it with a flood trigger, with some sort of recognition that we are in flood, therefore we waive these various constraints will be something I think that's critical to policy going forward to allow for this recharge to happen on a more expected basis when flood events occur. Right, so that, that we have the chance to move quickly when, when some unexpected uh, rain comes. And then there's the other aspect as well, right? Of um, being able to do recharge regularly with our kind of more typical supply constraints. So um, but I, I want to move back to Tim really quickly. 
you were saying before that you're kind of the broken rep record who comes on our stage and says, hey, we're really not doing enough here and we need to be concerned about these impacts um, and we need to move more quickly. My question for you is how is the how is climate change factoring into these impacts and sort of our, our risk of that 100 year flood instead of the 25 year flood, right? Um, and particularly in planning for future impacts. What I'm really getting at here is to ask you if there's a need for a statewide standard for flood control. Well, that's a small topic. Um, <laughs> I'm just one person, um, but I'm happy to try to answer the question. Uh, I will say that um, I've been part of three updates of the Central Valley Flood Protection Plan now, 2012, 2017, and in December of the 2022 update. And the plan is prepared by the Department of Water Resources, and then the Central Valley Flood Protection Board adopts the plan. And when we adopt the plan, we attach a resolution to it with what we think are some of the policy priorities. And one of them was just what she mentioned. How do we get our head around the standards that we have in place now? And how do we fold in the climate change hydrology, the future scenarios that are being forecasted into those standards? And it was not something we were going to figure out at that meeting in December, but we knew that we wanted to pursue it as part of the next update. And so we put um, a bullet in the resolution and we talked quite a bit with the um, Central Valley Flood Control Association about that issue. Um, and we tried to tee it up in a way that we'd be able to continue the discussion with them so we could look at that. There is a standard in the Central Valley in the plan for urban areas. There's not one for rural areas. And as a consequence of there being a standard, um, I think it's probably obvious, but a lot of the folks that are doing the most work and important work are driven by that standard. They're trying to meet it. And they're trying to meet it in a multi-benefit way, in the same way that Keith and Sarah have talked about, which is different. Um, and long story short, um, I'm going to have my, my, my math example here with some qualitative words, but rivers need floods. Right, we know that there's no commercial or sport fishing for salmon this year, in large part because of the drought the last several years. That's a big problem that affects a lot of communities. And the hydrology in the Central Valley is um, a big part of what happens. And the species in the valley, the native species, the plants and animals have, have evolved to these patterns and these rhythms, including floods. And people also need rivers, right? Keep talked about open spaces, parks, recreation areas super important for urban areas to have those in their backyard, not someplace you have to get in your car and drive to. And so if you do the math, that means people need floods, not catastrophic floods, not ones that are gonna create loss of life and property, but we wanna see that high water in the spring in particular, because we know that's part of the rhythm of these ecosystems. And part of the flood plan, we've always had the contribution strategy, which was a really important component articulate those benefits to the environmental world of the flood and the flood management system that we have in place for the Central Valley. So I would like there to see a, a discussion about a standard, um, not just in the Central Valley, because I think it does provide um, some motivation and obviously we'll need some funding to support that, but it also lets people really engage locally. What's happening on the ground in the Valley is driven by local regional forums. We also made a real big effort to create six regional flood management forums that are pushing these plans forward. So we're supporting them and there's a standard they're trying to meet, but they're putting together the details, which I think is really a key for the work that we're trying to do in the Valley. Mm -hmm. Okay, just to, to follow on to that a little bit, um, we've seen an enormous lack of <laughs> coordination and a lack of cooperation in the Tulare Basin in particular. Many folks are referring to it as the Wild West chains of command are not clear. Does something need to happen in the Tulare Basin in particular? Is there a need for a new regionally coordinated flood plan? Yeah, I'll just say real quick, I'm sure that um, Sarah's got some thoughts on this topic as well, but um, the map behind me is not an accident. I tried to pull this out. I have this on my wall. Um, this is an 1873 irrigation map of the Central Valley, and I focused on the San Joaquin side, and there's Tulare Lake right behind me. Um, the flood plan study area stops on the southern end of the San Joaquin River. It doesn't include the Tulare Basin, which of course, from a watershed perspective, doesn't make a lot of sense. And so there's never been a component for the Tulare Basin to be included in the Central Valley Flood Protection Plan. I think that's worth the discussion and revisiting. Um, it's hard to scramble during an emergency and make a plan, 
And I think that's what we're seeing now. People are trying to do the best they can given the conditions that we have, but they're putting plans together at the same time. And I think a lot of folks are working really hard and they've been able to manage this system for many years, for decades, but they're not really set up to manage a regional scale problem like this within the Valley, at least not as well as we could be. And I think there's a role for the state to play there. Our logo for the Central Valley Flood Protection Board is the entire Valley, it includes Tulare Basin. Any map, any state planning area of the Central Valley includes the Tulare Basin, but the flood plan doesn't yet. And I think I would like to have that discussion with my colleagues and with the folks in Tulare and the rest of the San Joaquin Valley, because some of that water is gonna end up in the San Joaquin River. And we are working with those local folks on the ground and they're having to prepare for it. And it only makes sense, I think, for us to be talking about it together in advance and to plan for these kinds of years so that we're not scrambling like we are now. We're always gonna scramble because um, every situation is different, but I think it helps to have a plan in place and to do some of that communication on the front end. And I'm hoping that happens. Sarah, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I think, I, I don't know that I realized all of that. So thank you, Tim, that's that's very insightful. You know, the Kings River and the Tulare Basin has a, a direct impact on the San Joaquin River. I mean, the flooding that, the flood flows that we're taking in Madera County are directly alleviating the pressure we're getting from the Kings River. So communities like Mendota and Firebaugh don't flood. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a major contributor to the San Joaquin River in situations like this. And, um, and so that coordination, I think, is ultimately critical. We work very, very closely with the San Joaquin Valley Lower Levy District, which runs the flood bypass in our area. And we have amazing coordination on how, how we can better manage that channel to the benefit of flood control. And so we talk about maintenance issues that they may, may need to be doing that would also benefit us with recharge opportunities. And so that... I don't think we can stress enough how important that coordination is. And one thing the governor did in his executive order is he allowed flood declarations to happen at the local level, which was also very important because that allowed each county or channel or jurisdiction to be able to make that determination at a point in time when they were seeing in real time those flood act, um, threats coming. So um, I I would support Tim in that we need to have a broader look at the the flood in the valley or flood management in the valley as a whole, and then you know really leaning on the local decision makers or operators to make those decisions. Thanks, Sarah. So I'm I'm just thinking about this issue of needing to accelerate some of some of this planning and implementation. Um, and we need to do things now when we're in the middle of a wet year, but also in, in the next dry year. And then, you know, when we're in this span um, of not thinking about floods very much. So Keith, maybe this is a question for you. How is the county thinking about accelerating um, some of these needed actions, um, whether it be for stormwater quality or water quality compliance, stormwater, what have you? Yeah, so... You know, the Safe Clean Water Program, um, you know, we've we've get, got it off the ground. We're in our third year of approved projects. Um, you know, we've, with the money collected, plus, you know, matching funds or other leverage funds, um, we have about 1.2 billion in approved projects that over the next, say, five years are expected to conserve about a half half mil enough water for a uh, half a million people which is you know a tr tremendous amount um but you know if we look at 30 years in this program to kind of grow it out um if we if we could just accelerate that now if we could leverage that income stream and build these projects now that's another 20 25 years of stormwater capture during these you know typical average annual storms again it's not a flood control program it's it's capturing and cleaning but it's reusing that water so i think you know we we are looking at how might we be able to to leverage that through some uh you know state or federal funding you know loan or program um we're also looking at you know our our regional 
flood control system, you know, it's a dual purpose flood control stormwater capture. And with these bigger, flashier storms, more storage is needed, more, you know, modifications to our facilities to capture that, you know, flashier, quicker, higher intensity rainfall uh, is needed. And we can, you know, we have projects that we know, you know, besides um, restoring reservoir capacity, we can modify our reservoirs, or our dams, we can enhance our spreading grounds, we can add new ones. So it's really a matter of, um, you know, funding and, and you know, accelerating these things that we, we know are working and doing more of that. And then just to, to highlight a little bit on what Tim and Sarah mentioned with respect to standards and, um, you know, we, you know, walk, everyone thinks of LA as highly urbanized. The North the north part of the county is not. There's not a lot of flood infrastructure there, and we manage flood risk typically through floodway mapping. We say here's here's where it's gonna gonna flood the worst, and don't build there. Um, and you know we're seeing that we're getting we're, you know those are generally FEMA standards. You know for our infrastructure, we're more LA specific. We've developed standards based on you know the the local geology, geography, rainfall patterns, um, but you know, federal home loans are backed by FEMA. So it's kind of, you have to balance which, which is the right one. But, but again, those, you know, FEMA hundred year flood, you know, maybe those are once in 70 years now, or maybe they should be designed differently. So I think it is important that in the face of this, you know, changing climate, um, we really do look at what, what should be the standards. And even beyond that, what are the um, mitigation measures you can take for, events that that may exceed our standard you know we have a great infrastructure um what if we get you know a, a storm that's larger than what it is intended to carry away so it's educating people on on flood risk what they can do that they can buy flood insurance having programs that they can recover faster things like that so really our next step besides looking at where we can enhance infrastructure is how do we educate communities about the flood risk that's there now and how can they help mitigate that Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Keith. So we've got about three minutes left until audience Q&A. So this is a good reminder to the audience. If you have any questions, send them our way. The email address is there on your screen. It is ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. And do remember to include your name and affiliation because we'd love to acknowledge you. Um, so before we skip over to Q&A, each of you has one minute. So I want to give you a lightning round opportunity. What is top of your wish list, okay, for the next five to six months um, till the end of the water year, let's say, that that you would like to see happen. And this could be on a policy level or personally in your role, um, what's what's most important to you for these next critical couple of months. Um, and I'll start with Sarah. Thank you. Uh, I think for me at the moment, the most important thing is finding a way to extend our period of time that we can divert under the executive order beyond June 1st, because I think July and August are going to have plenty of high flows that we should be ensuring that we have that flexibility as well. And then um, at the same time, you know, growing that amount of landowner base, farmer base that is actually diverting those, those flows and generating um, an improved aquifer and a new data set of information of what we can do. Wonderful. Keith? Yeah, you know, I, the thing I think that I, I we can get the most benefit from in the near term is really um, taking advantage of the focus that the flood risk that, you know, the everyone was well aware of the drought. Now all of a sudden they're aware of flood risk and flood control infrastructure. And at the same time, they're, they're thinking of the drought and, and water conservation. And I think it's it's a, an opportunity for people to understand their infrastructure, to understand the needs, understand what we're doing and really um, kind of showcase what's being done, um, continuing our, our, our projects, but getting a little more, um, you know, it's a better opportunity to educate communities because I think like Sarah said earlier, they, you know, you, they feel it, they touch it, they, they saw the rain, they saw the storms. Um, let's, let's take advantage of that. And, you know, before we can build anything, we need the support of the community that, that 
um, we're building the right thing and that it's beneficial to them. So I think that's where, where we'd like to focus and, and leveraging that to, um, you know, as well to state and, and federal opportunities for funding for these important programs. Great. Thanks, Keith. Tim, you want to bring us home? <laughs> sure. Um, I would say two things. In the very near term, um, I want to make sure that everybody does what they can. And I think we are, and the state is there as well, support the people that are going to be directly affected by what's going to happen and what is happening. A lot of folks have been displaced. It's going to be that way for a long time. Uh, Jeff touched on the environmental justice issue with the communities in particular in the Tulare Basin and the San Joaquin. Those are really important. Um, and I think we're just playing defense at this point to do the best we can. And when we get through that period, I would love to have a discussion at the policy level um, and to have people nod their heads when we think about the San Joaquin Valley in particular, and maybe add the Tulare Basin as well. The system needs to be different. It needs to be not just managed differently, but the river system and the river quarters need to be larger. There's just years we can't capture all the water that's coming our way. And there's lots of good reasons to make expanded corridors uh, in the Central Valley to support the communities and the people who live there, but also to minimize the risk from flooding that damages those properties. So if people have that uh, ability to turn the corner and to just acknowledge that it wants, we need it to be different, we want it to be different, then we can talk about how and the when. And like he said, uh, really try to articulate the benefits to people who live in those areas um, and have them fully engaged. Okay, thanks, Tim. So it is now time for our audience Q&A, and I'd like to welcome Jeff Mount back to the virtual stage for this portion. Uh, if you have questions for Jeff as well, please feel free to send those in. Um, our first question comes from Jackie Duran, who works in the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, and Jackie asks, what role could the federal government play, whether through FEMA or the Army Corps of Engineers, to mitigate flood potential? Tim, do you want to take a stab at that first? Yeah. Um, State and local policy a little <clears throat> bit, as well as federal a little bit. So maybe. It's yeah, I think folks know this, but the board is the non-federal sponsor to the State Plan of Flood Control Facilities in the Central Valley. And we work very closely with the Corps, obviously, day to day. Um, a lot of the programs that are set up now are really to support the system as it exists. Um, and we've tried to figure out a way to change the system and to navigate the federal side of that process to set levies back. It's extremely complicated. We've also tried to um, decommission levies when we don't want them to be there anymore. That's also very complicated. Both of those events have taken sometimes as long as decades, 25 years. Um, and so I think what would be really great is to have some additional tools on the federal side to make those changes when the local folks in the state realize that we want to do it and we can do it and we should do it. It needs to be done more quickly. Um, funding is always a big component as well, and they're really great at supporting the construction projects, and that's happening. Um, but the regulatory side of modifying the federal flood control system um, is very complicated, and I think we'd like to see some attention on that. And if I could just pile on for a second, I know also when things do happen and we ask the court to come in and help us, the state, um, the process to recover has also, for whatever reason, taken now a very long time. We're still recovering from 2017 storms, which it shouldn't take that long. And there's going to be damage more, more damage this year. And we don't want to wait five or six years for those things to, to be repaired. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on that from our other panelists? I would just add, I think it's, I, I think the, the timeline of getting some of these things done uh, between so many different agencies at the federal and state level is really a big hindrance. And we're seeing that in some of these channels that have not been able to achieve a stream bed alteration permit. And so that they could go in and clean out the debris that had occurred over the years. And you know, these are things that we really need to clean up and be more proactive on. And it would make a huge difference on having flood channels that are operative in the way they were built for. So I think there's a lot of varying agencies at all uh, at all levels that need to address the, the streamlining ability within these regulatory restrictions. I, I would echo what Sarah said. Okay, another question from David Linville who is a graduate student at UC Santa Barbara. David asks, is it antiquated to say that water is wasted to the ocean? 
with regard to the needs of the Delta, coastal ecosystems, and fish in general, how can you capture more water without further depleting ecosystems? And Jeff is smiling. I think this is a great question for you. <laughs> Thanks. And so, yeah, this is always uh, uh, about this time of year or, or year, wet years like this, we hear that phrase, water wasted to the sea, way too much. Uh, uh, and, in, and in fact, my, my point is, is that water that flows out of the, Sac the Sacramento and San Joaquin Valley and into San Francisco Bay actually creates benefit in the Bay. So therefore, by definition, it is not wasted. But I also want to emphasize in wet years like this, you know, we've looked very closely at PPIC to wet years like this. There are many opportunities to take water and store it. Again, this is why we're emphasizing this wet year management and store it without measurable harm to the environment. And we need, and that's where I think, you know, particularly the State Water Resources Control Board can help kind of streamline this. The very things that, that that Sarah is dealing with on a day in day out basis is so we can get to that level of assurance that that what we're the water we are storing is not creating third party effects. Uh, and I and, you know, and good people are making a lot of progress on this issue. And I and, I, and again, particularly like you say in Sarah's Sarah's world, this is this is important. But I want to say it again. If it is creating benefit, then it is by definition not wasted. And I, I really hate that phrase, as you can tell. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Um, this is a question for Keith. An audience member asks, uh, the cycle of drought, wild, wildfire, flood is leading to a lot of debris in reservoir, as you touched on earlier in the conversation. So just how expensive is this to manage and what exactly needs to be done? And also, who is paying for this? Right. So, so right now the, the flood control district is paying for it. So the, the residents of the, the, the county that, that on their parcel property tax, they, they, they pay, or well, I think on average, uh, 40 to $70 a year, which is a pretty good, good bargain for a flood control system that works. Um, but, but uh, we do pay for that. Uh, we looking, we're looking that we probably have $550 million in sediment removal cost anticipated over the next 10 years. Um, that's just uh, not not sustainable uh, for our agency. You know, this is um, largely due to the, the increased number of fires and, and uh, sediment events, uh, as well as increasing costs to, to manage that sediment and increasingly um, fewer places to, to, to place it. So it's, uh, it really is one of the challenges that's been amplified by uh, climate impacts. And so we are, we say we're, we're, we're funding those now. We, we'd like to see, um, you know, some fe federal funding to help with these extreme events that are climate driven that cause, you know, this loss of capacity for flood control and, and water conservation. Yeah. Thanks, Keith. All right. So for Sarah now, I've got an audience, audience member question saying, I've read that a lot of nitrates are washing into the water supply right now. So how can farmers deal with the nitrate problem proactively, particularly from the, the lens of groundwater recharge? Yeah, I think the nitrate concerns um, that we have throughout the valley overall, you know, we have a, a lot of new programs that are being initiated to decrease the amount of nitrates, to deal with um, nitrates that are already in the soil. And, and there is a concern that adding water on top of those um, soils with heavy levels of nitrate will only further concentrate or push the water into areas where drinking water wells are drying it out. And I think that's a completely valid concern and one that needs to, to be addressed. Um, however, there is also a lot of benefit from recharging in those highly um, concentrated areas by flushing out and diluting the water as well. So there's, we're going to have to find a balance of how we can flush the soils. This is a practice we do in agriculture regularly because you can get salt, we get a lot of salts in the water naturally that come out. And if we're doing just drip irrigation where we're putting water directly to the plant, those salts really build up. So when we have times of abundance of, in water supply, we do more or try to do more of um, flood irrigation or excess irrigation so that we're pushing those salts and spreading them more evenly into the soil. Similar thing is going to happen with nitrates. However, where you're around drinking water wells, you really need to take precautions and you really we really need to understand how that water is moving through the soil profile and um, ensure that we are not degrading those 
water qualities and only improving them. And so there's a lot of work that needs to be done here. And I think this year where recharge is happening in a more, um, in a larger scale, and we're doing a lot more monitoring than we used to in the past, we're going to be able to learn a lot from that. And we need to take this opportunity to do that. But um, working around drinking water wells is critically important to ensure that we don't degrade the quality of that drinking water and we work towards improving it. Right. So this kind of speaks to what you were saying earlier about how we need to do our homework now to understand the hydrology, when to recharge, where to recharge, it's most appropriate so that when we have opportunities like this, we're kind of ready to go, right? Yes. So, yeah. Um, next question, Tim Parker of Parker Groundwater asks the following, how can we comprehensively assess and modify infrastructure to address climate whiplash? and allow for local multi-benefit recharge and storage projects. Tim, would you like to take a stab at that? Yeah, I think the short answer is to expand the river corridors um, and let rivers be connected to their floodplains again, let that water um, provide those benefits to those plants and animals, let it sink into the aquifers. Um, that's the short answer. I think there's lots of places where that has been done in the last 25 years, and there's great examples um, that we can point to in the Central Valley. And we're hoping that we could accelerate those kinds of projects. Um, one of the things I think you hear in common from Keith and from Sarah that we all wrestle with is the process that is set up now um, that has been in place for many years isn't really set up to do the kind of things that we want to do now. And so it takes a long time. Um, and some of these multi-benefit projects are funded from 10 or 20 different fund sources. Um, they have to navigate the permit world just like any construction project does. Uh, it's just really hard and complicated because we don't have programs set up yet to support the kind of things that we would like to do, um, like the questioner uh, was asking. Um, and right now, people are just finding a way to piece it together. Uh, it takes a lot of work and time to make those things happen. And I think we're trying to find a way to do it more quickly and taking the burden off of the very creative, energetic applicants who are taking the lead um, and modifying the programs when we can to make it easier for the people that are coming behind them to do those same kinds of projects. And Tim, you, you were talking a bit earlier about the, the very important impacts we're seeing on communities from uh, this year's flooding. Is there a role for flood insurance uh, to improve the flood preparedness of Californians? I think the short answer is yes, that's a super complicated issue. Um, Keith touched on it as well, the combination of federal um, regulatory hurdles, FEMA, um, what folks do locally. Um, there's just a lot of different um, frameworks in place and landowners and homeowners have to figure out how to navigate all of them, uh, just like some of the agencies do. And it makes it really hard for individual people to do that. And I think at the very least, we should try to do what we can to make it a little more clear and coherent to people so they understand that. Um, and also the education that Keith touched on as well to those same, those same individuals and communities. If you're renting, you might not know any of those things at all. You're, you're not the homeowner. You don't get exposed to that same set of information, but you're at risk uh, unless somebody's told you about the place that you live and what kind of risk you have by being in that location. So there's a lot of work to do there. It's definitely a piece of the puzzle. Okay, we have about a minute left. Any final thoughts from our panelists or from Jeff? You know, I would I would add one thing that I think um, is a, a a theme here. You know, it was said early that we need education, and a lot of people don't know where their water supply comes from. And I think to Tim's point that you know there's there's a lot of new work being done, but our systems weren't really built for this originally. I think we all need to learn from each other as to how these different processes work, and you know, understanding recharge isn't something most urban residents know, and quite frankly, a lot of um, farmers maybe are doing, but didn't know they were doing it in, in the same, the way we term it now. So I think there does need to be a lot of collaboration between all the different sectors to um, fix some of these problems. Okay. Thank you very much to all three of you. Um, I'd like to thank Andrew Ayers for setting the stage for today's event and to Jeffrey Mount for his informative presentation. We've reached the end of our program for today. So a big thanks to our funders, ST Bechtel Jr. Foundation, um, and to our panelists for joining us today. And finally, thank you to all of you for joining us online.
If you pre-registered for this event later today, you will receive a survey in your inbox. We'd appreciate it if you could take a couple of minutes to fill that out and tell us how we can make these events better. Thank you again. Please be safe and have a great afternoon.